Uh, today's session is a part of our series titled Women's Rights as Human Rights and today we're going to discuss the issue of femicide in Pakistan and also we're going to discuss uh, femicide in Mexico which is a country that has been dealing with an increase in a number of cases of femicide for past few years. So we're going to see if we have some uh, lesson that we could learn from Mexico. So for today's session we have uh, four human rights uh, lawyers with us two human rights lawyers from Mexico and two criminal lawyers from Pakistan who are also working in the field of human rights. So I'm going to start the session by introducing my guest. So we have with us Ms. Nancy Bautista. She, uh, Nancy earned her law degree uh, with honors from National Autonomous University of Mexico in 2018 and her LLM cum laude from University of Notre Dame she was, uh, where she was a uh, Riley uh, scholar. She holds a diploma in gender sexuality uh, and the law from the Center of Research and Teaching in Economics. And uh, in 2016, she interned at the Center for Justice and International Law in San Jose, Costa Rica, where she focused on gender cases before the Inter-American Court for Human Rights. She also completed a professional visit at the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, assisting in the drafting of a judgment involving transitional justice. In 2017, she worked as a law clerk in Mexico's Supreme Court of Justice. Following her clerkship, Bautista worked at the National Victims Commission, where she oversaw legal representation for human rights victims and coordinated cases before the Inter-American System of Human Rights. In 2019, she worked at the National Search Commission for Missing Persons in Mexico. In 2021, Bautista was a researcher for interdisciplinary group of independent experts for Bolivia. She received the Youth Award for Defense and Promotion of Human Rights given by the government of Mexico City in 2019. And she is currently working at the Inter-American Commission uh, on Human Rights in Washington, DC. So welcome to the uh, Global Institute of Law, Nancy. And now next, I'm going to introduce Ana uh, Isabel Anayansi Orizaga. She is a Mexican lawyer from Tijuana, Baja California, dedicated to the defense and protection of human rights and women's rights. She holds a law degree from the Autonomous University of Baja California, a master's degree in constitutional protection and inter-American inter system of fundamental rights from the Institute of Legal Research at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and the Complutense University of Madrid and a master's degree in international human rights law from University of Notre Dame. She is a former professional visitor at the Inter-American Court for Human Rights in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica. She has worked as a lawyer at the National Human Rights Commission in Mexico and has research, recently worked as a visiting professional at the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva, Switzerland. So thank you for joining us, Anna. So next I'm going to- Thank you for having me. So now I'm going to uh, introduce Mr. Muxid Heather Ali. He's a criminal lawyer from Pakistan. After completing his LLB from Lahore University of Management Sciences, Muxit Heather Ali worked at a criminal chamber dealing with violent crime cases for a couple of years. He has worked on several cases involving violence against women. And he was part of the team that worked on one of the most prominent cases involving violence against women in Pakistan, that is the Khadija Siddiqui case. And she was a law student and an attempted murder survivor. So Muxit's team had won the case at the Supreme Court of Pakistan. Um, and currently he's working as an independent uh, criminal lawyer and specializes in cyber crimes. At his law firms, he has started an awareness campaign where he discusses and provides uh, information about different legal issues to the public in detail. His aim is to enhance the knowledge about basic legal procedures uh, so that the people of Pakistan do not shy away from seeking legal, legal representation as under reporting of cases uh, is involving violence against women is a major uh, concern in Pakistan right now. His law firm also provides free legal representation to the victim of, victims of domestic violence and also the victims of uh, abuse and um, other uh, um, crimes against women. And he is he also teaches criminal law. He's also a lecturer in criminal law. So thank you for joining us today, Muxir. And thank you now, so much. Uh, we have with us Mr. Hadi Ali. Uh, he is a human rights lawyer from Pakistan and he, uh, he specializes in criminal law and constitutional law. 
after completing his legal study from Newcastle University, he joined uh, the late Asma Jahangir's legal aid clinic, where he worked on a number of cases involving violence against women. He has also worked with Barrister Sara Bilal at the Justice Project Pakistan, which is an organization uh, dedicated to abolishing death penalty in Pakistan. He is founder of the Fair Trial Defenders Legal Aid Cell that carries out strategic litigation on the fundamental right to fair trial as enshrined under the Article 10 of Constitution of Pakistan. At his legal aid cell, Hadi has been taking up pro bono cases involving violence against women, including rape, domestic violence, and other violent crimes against women. He is also the General Secretary of the Human Rights Committee at the Punjab Bar Council. He is also a lecturer of human rights law, and he is an organization or uh, uh, he's organizer of the women's rights uh, uh, women's march in his city, Multan. So thank you for joining us, Hadi. Thank you, Noor. It's great being here. It's an honor to have you all here. So now I'm going to start uh, by asking a question from my uh, colleagues from Mexico. So please tell us a bit about the history and current situation of femicide in Mexico. So uh, Nancy, you can go first. And then Anna, you can also uh, add into. Thank you, Nur. Um, as well, I want to start um, saying that nowadays 10 women are being killed every day. So we are in a hard situation, but Mexico is working a lot uh, through public policies and with the enactment of many laws to <clears throat> try to face this situation. But um, nowadays our, our situation regarding uh, gender violence is harsh. <coughs> Sorry, I'm a little sick. It's okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It's okay, Anna. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Well, uh, for sure. Well, firstly, I would like to mention that I would like to talk about the origin of the term femicide and feminicide, which is very important. Uh, this term was coined by Diane Russell, and it was used for the first time in a declaration made by her uh, before the first tribunal on crimes against women in 1976. Uh, Diane Russell defined this term as uh, a killing of a female by a man because uh, she is a female. So I, I think that uh, keeping this in mind is very important because the root of the crime of like the feminicide is, uh, is like, it's because it's a gender-based killing. So this uh, term femicide was eventually adopted in Latin America with the increasing of uh, movements of feminist movements. And it was adopted by the feminist Marcela Lagarde uh, she transformed this term from femicide to feminicide to make a reference to the lack of activity of the Mexican government to prosecute the cases of feminicide in Mexico. As we, as we know, uh, in, in Mexico during the 90s, we have a really serious problem of uh, violence against women, especially in the north part of the country. And it, this uh, phenomenon was called Las Muertas de Juarez or the death women of Juarez. Uh, this uh, phenomenon was or consisted in a lot of cases of like disappeared women in the north part of Mexico. The cases attracted the international attention and the cases, some of the cases reached the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So as a result, uh, the, the, the Inter-American Court ruled uh, its leading case, uh, Cotton Field versus Mexico. And of course, the, the term of feminicide was uh, adopted and it has been used uh, for like the academia, the governments and the civil society to describe this problem, which is like gender-based killing. So I don't know if like my, my colleague Nancy would like to add something else. Sorry, yeah. Um, I just want, only want to say that um, regarding Cottonfield case, um, like uh, years ago, women was being seen as a person who doesn't need to work because they, the men is a, the one that have to work. So when, in Mexico, the industry start to need um, women 
then the violence against women also start because um, men was uh, against um, this role of women working in the industry. So that's why the violence is increased in Ciudad Juarez in the case uh, Cotton Field. And it's very important because it's uh, like um, um, breaking the standard of women staying at home and then going and work instead of men. So that's why um, the violence increase in Ciudad Juarez. Um, <clears throat> that was uh, the start of violence regarding the disappearance against women <coughs> and also the femicide as Anayansi said before. Okay. Thank you for answering my question. So I'm going to ask the same question from Muxid and Hadi uh, uh, for Pakistan. So tell us a bit about the history and the current situation of femicide in Pakistan, like what is happening in uh, Muxid, you can start and then Hadi can add. So Noor, throughout our history, at least in the last few years, we can see that every year, almost every year, there is this seminal moment and this case regarding a specific case of violence against women that always enters the limelight each and every year. This year, it was the Dumu Kadam case, and we all know that it was a case involving an extremely gruesome and violent act, which resulted in the death of Dumu Kadam. Last year, there was the motorway gang rape case. The year before that, we had a couple of cases in which doctors who were students at hostels were killed by some of their friends. The year before that, we had the Zainab uh, rape and murder case, and then there was the Khadira Siddiqui case. So every year, if we examine every year, there is a specific act of violence against women, and women and men both, they say that now we've had enough, and this is going to be the last one, and after this, things are going to get better, because the violence of the crime is such that it receives so much attention that we feel that something must be done and something must be going on in the background, which is going to put an end to this. But year after year, the situation unfortunately worsens and we are right back to square one at the start of every year and nothing is ever done. So one theme which has remained consistent throughout the history of Pakistan is, and let me just put in a very basic concept of criminal law, Every first year law student is taught that the basic distinction between criminal law and civil law is that a criminal offense is a violation and a wrong against society as a whole, whereas civil uh, violations are violations just against the individual. But very unfortunately, the state of Pakistan still persists in treating violence against women and offenses against women, not as a concern against society, but as a concern just against that particular family uh, whose female member has been murdered. And as a result, police officials, they just back away. They say that this is a matter whenever a femicide occurs. They say that it's a matter which is supposed to be resolved by the family members themselves and that they are not going to intervene in that matter at all. The only thing which I feel has changed is that now we have social media and citizens can partake in discussion through which they can make that murder, they can make that death of that female a concern for the rest of society. They create so much attention and lawful awareness regarding that topic that it does become a concern for society. And then there's pressure on the higher ups of those police officials and they make them investigate those cases and they make them build strong cases which can be argued and prosecuted in court. So this, I feel that it has broadly remained the same, the history, but there are some improvements, but most of them aren't related to actual awareness about women's rights or respect for women's rights, but more technological and there are more changes which have transferred to us from the uh, advancements in women's rights that have been made across the world. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, Noor, I'll just, uh, I'll just add on to what Moksud very rightfully said yeah. that every year we get this w one of these cases which just, you know, um, sends a chill down our, our spine and everyone, everyone feels it at home that this is really, this is not a very safe. Um, uh, environment society to send our women out or not a very safe environment for anyone in fact so it just gives it just it's, it's really scary what happens around but I'll just add on that um, I believe um, there have been a number of very violent uh, crimes and incidents against women it's just that they've been they're being more you know um, rightfully reported now so they've always been happening. And, and I think these, these cases are really important or they've have, have for example, the news case or Khadija's case, they've happened in, you know, major cities and they've gotten more media 
attention to them okay. which is why everyone everyone you know uh, gets to hear a harrowing story of a female um, member of the society but if you if you come down to these smaller towns and cities uh, if you come to the rural areas a lot of these incidents never get reported so for example in in, in south punjab for example in south punjab um, so kandil baloch's case was one of the uh, many that was reported because she she had that um, i'd say she'd had that some sort of media presence so her career was in the media industry um she she was starting a very prosperous career in the media industry but uh, these really household and you know uh, grassroots level incidents happen every day around us and it's just really scary that no one no one you know bats an eye on how this is not these are not isolated isolated incident but there's a pattern there's a pattern around them and there there's a there's a um i'd say there's a there's a mind frame behind them so so femicide like a like our you know friends from mexico uh, rightfully said that when we're talking about femicide there needs to be a motivation or there needs to be some sort of reason behind a violent act being happening based on the gender of the victim so so that that needs to you know get more attention on why why is the why is the the difference of gender a reason uh, for that violent crime Okay, so both Muksin and Hadi, you are saying that only those cases are treated properly who, that get it media coverage or proper attention from media in Pakistan. Yes, like, and that just know? one thing which I would like to add is that Hadi also knows this that uh, horrific murders like the one which occurred in Noor Mukaddam's case, these things are not something which are too unique for the rural areas of Pakistan. beheadings like that do occur and the motivations for those beheadings could be a child custody dispute or an inheritance dispute or a woman who is seeking divorce from her husband and unfortunately these cases are never reported and these cases right now are sitting as case files inside our chambers and in court records and in police files but because they don't they don't occur in urban areas they don't receive the same level of attention which yeah. perhaps these cases which i mentioned before they they get thank you so um, now my question is from um, nancy and and i nancy that there was a report that was published in 2020 that uh, stated that 93% of the crimes involving femicide were not uh, either not reported or not investigated in uh, 2018 in mexico so uh, what are the reasons behind such a high rate of impunity for the perpetrators of this crime in mexico Uh, so do you think there is a loophole in the law or the legal proce- process or it's this people just don't want to bring these cases to the court is it something related to the culture of shame that is associated with uh, the family of the victim so what are you what are your thoughts on it and anna you can yeah for sure well uh yeah uh, just concerning what uh hari just previously mentioned and it, which is related to uh, to your question uh, nor is that the root of uh this kind of crimes against women and girls uh, uh these uh, these crimes have um or are based in a sexist culture yes. and in a on a conception that women are a possession and yes. can be used by men uh, by according to their desires and yeah. after that they just can be killed so yeah. it's very important to mention that the reason and the the root of these kind of crimes crimes are uh, this sexist culture so uh, in mexico we we introduce the femis, feminicide as a crime in our criminal law um code in 2012 as a result of this uh case the cotton field versus mexico and the government have has adopted several initiatives uh such as protocols laws and trainings for officials and people involved in the prosecution of femicide so however uh, even though we have like this uh femicide in our criminal code and in, in our laws in we have protocols and international instruments in mexico we still are uh having several challenges about how to prosecute and how to investigate yeah. cases of femicide for example one uh thing that i i would highlight or i would like to point out is like the fact that there 
there is a persistence of uh, gender stereotypes among the people involved in the prosecution or in the investigation. For example, in, in Mexico, there are like some like diverse models of brandies and how feminicides are committed, but some of them uh, consist uh, in, in like the disappearance of the women or of the girls. So the families go to report the disappearance to the police station, and the first thing that they are like requested or the, 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 the question that the authorities make to them is like, okay, so um, what was your daughter wearing that day? Yeah. Or what kind of friends uh, does your, your, your daughter know? It's like the responsibility of the disappearances over the, 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 the person who disappeared. So this is based in, 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 a, in, in gender stereotypes about like if the women deserve Yes. Uh, like the, the woman deserves to, to be killed. And uh, for sure, I would mention that this is one of the ob obstacles that, that, uh, that we are facing in Mexico, that the people and the authorities, the judges and the, the people involved in the investigation are not well prepared or system justice in Mexico is not well prepared to prosecute feminicide. So yes. I don't know if like my, my colleague uh, Nancy would mention something else, but uh, for sure. Yeah, I only want to say that uh, one thing is the process. As Nancy said, um, people are not prepared to investigate these kind of crimes, but also we need to talk about the impunity. So uh, most of these crimes are not get resolved. So people only women only suffer these or, or struggle with this kind of process but they don't have any justice and also i want to say regarding the law <clears throat> as anayansi said with the with the case cotton field mexico start to um, develop a different kinds of protocols or uh, enacting laws regarding uh, gender violence and we have a lot of laws in each state and also at the national level we have like um, general law for equality between uh, women and men and also we have the general law of uh, on women access to a life free of violence but um, as we can see in our reality um, these laws and these public policies are not enough for facing the reality of Mexico because as Anayansi says, <clears throat> there's a lot of um, different kind of stereotypes. There's a lot of um, problems regarding the, the roots of the problem regarding gender violence. So um, even if we have a lot of laws and a lot of public policies, this is not enough if we face the reality that we have in our country. Um, and also I want to say that uh, we need to recognize that with um, the case cotton field, Mexico start to develop many, many um, different kinds of public policies in each state. But um, as, as I said before, this is not enough. <coughs> so yes, most of you are saying that, yeah, okay, Anna, you can. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> no, no, I would like to, to add like yeah, to what uh, Nancy mentioned. is like, for example, in our protocol and in our uh, criminal code, uh, the criminal code establishes that uh, there are um, a kind of characteristics to determine that a, a killing of a woman is a femicide. For example, if, you, if the authorities find the body with signs of uh, sexual violence, for example, if they um, they know that there were uh, previous incidents of domestic violence between the, the perpetrator of the femicide and the victim. Uh, for example, if the body uh, shows uh, some signs of violence before and after the, the killing, or if the body appears in a public space, uh, also, another like um, thing that authorities have to keep on mind is like if there was a previous relationship uh, between the perpetrator and and the and the victim. So the problem is not is not as, as mentioned uh, as Nancy mentioned is not like the, a lack of instruments. We still we still have uh, laws and instruments. No. So the thing is like the culture 
uh, among yeah. authorities and people uh, is uh, well, it's a culture of uh, stereotypes and, and, and it's a sexist culture for sure. And that's what I was going to say that both of you are saying that there, is, uh, there isn't an issue on the legislative front, but there's an inherent bias against the victims of femicide uh, in Mexico, so, which leads to the issue of underreporting of cases. So I have the I have a similar question from Muxed and Hadi as well. Like I could not find any report that uh, gave me percentage of cases that go on under report uh, unreported in Pakistan or something like that. But I want to ask you if there is a low, uh, like if there is an un issue of underreporting of cases in Pakistan as well, and also if if there is a low conviction rate for such cases in Pakistan and the reasons behind it or this issue, like if it's a cultural issue or if there's an issue with the law. So Hadi, you can start and then Muxed uh, will add into that. Yeah, so Noor, um, uh, I, I haven't also come across a report which would show a statistic on yeah. how many cases go underreported. But you I can, can tell you from my, yeah, yeah, but I can tell you from my personal experience that the number of times uh, for, I mean, for our legal aid cell, because it's a pro bono cell and everyone can just walk in with their case without any, you know, uh, commitment of legal dues and fees. So the number of times we've had to compel a family or even victims um, that it will be okay if they bring up this case or if they would let us prosecute the offender. Because there's very, it, it also comes down to uh, the sort of uh, faith and the sort of trust people have in the legal system. And that's yeah. just really uh, going down the lane by every day because of the sort of treatment uh, victims, victims of violence, are. especially women, get in these courts. So, so there's, there's, it's, a very, it's a very staggering number of people who would not want to bring their case to court. And they would say that we've, we've been through a lot already and bringing our case to court will only cause more problems for us and there's very little hope of getting justice from the current system. So in terms of the uh, loopholes, which was the first question, yeah. I think I think there's there's a massive loophole. Like Moksit uh, mentioned earlier, um, there's an inherent uh, flaw in the system when it comes to criminal law that we still have the laws of Diyat and Kisas. Yeah. And that just literally translates into, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure it was made or introduced back in the days with a very good intention and would have a really great effect on the society and the harmony and everything. But right now, all that means is that you can get away with murder. You can get away with a lot of stuff just because you have that privileged position in the society or just because you have the resources to intimidate or threaten people to take, take back their cases. And we've seen that happen all the time. Um, we've already we were already having troubles because of this because we have an adversarial system of justice and adversarial system of justice in a country like Pakistan where there's huge disparity amongst people and um, what sort of legal recourse or the sort of legal prosecution or defense you'd have will depend on the so amount of money you have or how privileged you are that was already a problem and then added that with the um, lack of proper um, witness protection laws, the lack of the writ of the government and the rule of law where people would feel safe that they've, you know, they've, they're, they're pursuing something in a legal system. They're, they're interacting with the state right now or the state would stand right next to them when it comes to prosecuting or, um, you know, uh, giving testimony in a court of law. That just doesn't happen here in this country, which is why people don't, again, have faith in the system. And it's it's common advice not to, um, you know, take your case to the court and try, you know, and fail getting justice from there. So, Moksit, can you um, add into that and also explain yes. some of the laws uh, like Kisas and Diyat to like, these people? And also yes, others? absolutely. Uh, Hadi very rightfully mentioned the Kasas and Diyat laws. And just for the benefit of our Mexican colleagues and your audience as well, I would just like to expand a bit further on Thank them. You. So the law of compromise, basically, let me just describe a situation. It states that if 
a female or any other person, uh, regardless of their gender, is killed by another person. The laws of Pakistan, the state laws of Pakistan, they allow the offender to get away with getting a punishment for that crime by being able to pay a certain amount of blood money or arriving at a compromise with the family or the legal heirs of the deceased of the person who has been murdered. So for specifically discussing femicide, the way it impacts everything and the way it completely nullifies the possibility of women achieving justice for uh, killing is that a husband's family or a man's family, they may have certain more resources, more influence, more political power than the family of the deceased woman. And as a result, they are perfectly well able to influence the police pressurize, uh, use pressurizing and intimidating tactics against the victim and her family members and pressure and threaten them into arriving at a compromise with the offender's family. And after they pay a certain amount of blood money or in one case, which uh, I heard about, the family of the, uh, the person who was the female who was killed, her father asked the authorities that you build a road in my area and you provide certain charitable contributions to us and you pay this amount of undisclosed, this undisclosed sum to me as compensation. And then I will forget the matter and I will forego my right to pursue justice for my daughter and the state will forego its responsibility and duty to pursue justice on behalf of the victim as long as that blood money and that compensation has been paid. So this is something which is sanctioned and which has been legislated by our very laws. And it was legislated in a time when Pakistan was undergoing a process of Islamization. And of course, the remedies which were applicable 1400 years ago in Islamic society, when there was no straight structure and the entire Muslim society existed as tribes, this was a compromise which they had reached to be able to resolve their own criminal disputes and they used this as a deterrent in that context, in that society where it might have been effective. But now when we have a state structure, when we have a police force, when we have a prosecution agency, this type of compromise does not make any sense. Another loophole which I would just like to briefly mention is that we are sitting here right now in 2021 and women in Pakistan still cannot issue or still cannot use or and cannot apply for a restraining order against a person who was harassing her or a man who was offending her or somebody who's threatening her. Whenever a case of femicide occurs, it doesn't just occur in one swift, immediate and final moment. There is sometimes and usually a build up to that event. A woman is restricted from leaving her house. She's threatened, she's abused. Her family members become more violent towards her. And in those situations, a restraining order would be so important in trying to prevent future offenses from occurring. But the Protection of Women Against Violence Act 2016, which was passed by our National Assembly and passed by our Senate, the reason why, which contains this remedy of an, uh, a restraining order, the reason why it's not in force right now is a very simple and a very basic one. And that is that the provincial governments which were responsible for enacting that law, they have to issue a very simple notification, just have to sign a piece of paper and say that from henceforth, this law is effective in our jurisdiction. But that is something which they have failed and neglected to do. And there is just one city in which that entire legislation is applicable and the rest of Pakistan cannot even use that legislation. And so you can't apply for a, a simple thing as simple a thing as a restraining order. Thank you for answering the questions. So now I'm going to ask Anna and Nancy. So there are two conflicting theories regarding the um, uh, high, higher number of cases in certain regions. So one states that uh, cases involving violence against women occur in regions that are more conservative in nature. Uh, more patriarchal regions so that women are not allowed to come out of the houses and you know it's uh, so these cases are um, like they're higher in number in those regions as I, I was reading a report in Mexico but there are certain reports uh, from recent years that state that uh, the cases of femicide now are a reaction to the women's uh, demands for equal rights and also the women's rights movement that are asking for uh, uh, for punishment for the perpetrators of the violence against women. So how do you make sense of it? Like, was it the, are the cases higher in the uh, region that are more conservative in nature or, or, or these cases are a reaction to the current movements against femicide in Mexico? So wh what is your opinion? Anna? Yeah, well, uh... 
I don't know. I, you know, I think that, um, well, according to to the Economic Commission for the Latin American and the Caribbean, 14, and just to mention this um, info, uh, 14 of the 25 countries with the most feminicides in the world are in Latin America. Yeah. So El Salvador, Guatemala, and South Africa are the top three countries on the list. So this is a study of 221 countries. And I wouldn't say from my, my perspective yeah. that the feminicide is a problem that can be linked to a yeah. conservative or a progressive yeah. society. It I think that violence- happens. It's a crime, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. Gender. I would say that the problem of violence against women and girls, it's a common problem and it's happening around the world. So it's not like that the progressive societies uh, have Regardless more like higher rights of, of feminicide. And I think that uh, approaching the problem in that way, it would be maybe not the best way to exactly. recognize that uh, even if you are progressive or conservative, yeah. it, it means that you are not, or you, you, you don't have that problem in your society or in your country. Yeah. So I don't know if like my if Nancy would like to to add something, but uh, I I think that feminicide is the highest expression of hate and violence against women and girls, and it goes beyond the belief culture. Of yeah. course, in a yeah. in a conservative uh, society, it can influence uh, for sure the, the the culture, but I wouldn't say that it's like directly linked to, to this. Yeah, I totally agree with Anna Yancy, and I only want to add that um, also we need to take in consideration that <clears throat> based on these kind of stereotypes that women need to be at home cleaning, cleaning, cooking, we need to recognize that when women go out and demand, as you said, in feminist movements, the <clears throat> the men doesn't like that you know um women raising their boys is not well um it's not like uh the best thing that women need to do because in in this kind of stereotypes women need to be at home so so i totally agree with anna Yancy, but i also will say that um this movement uh feminist movement in mexico it's raising this hate against women um, <clears throat> and also this could be seen um, similar as the thing that happened with the case cotton field. When women start working outside the, the, the home, uh, men start um, killing women. So it's kind of the same. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, I have the same and question from Muxit and Hadi as well. Like, do you think the culture of a certain region has a role to play in the number of cases of violence against women or because the recent cases, the Noor Mukaddam case and Khadija Siddiqui case or like both of them were educated women. So what what would you like to say about it? Like, is there any difference or it's the same number of cases and how they're dealt with? Muxit, you can start. And... So firstly, I am no expert on feminism and uh, at a very basic level, the definition of feminism is about equal, achieving rights which are equal to that of men. But at an even more basic level, it is also about women enforcing the rights which not only have been granted to them by the laws of a country, but also by natural laws such as dignity, etc. So if we analyze the major categories of crimes which occur against women in Pakistan, we have honor killings, we have domestic violence, we have uh, deaths which occur because of uh, inheritance disputes, and we have deaths which occur over child custody cases. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the common theme across all of these, these four categories of crimes is that a woman tries to act in a manner that is independent. She tries to avail a remedy which has been granted to her by the law, such as uh, asking from the courts the right of custody over a child or enforcing her inheritance rights over the property which she has been left behind through the courts. And when she asserts that independence, when she tries to go to the courts and get those rights enforced, the result is that she is sometimes met with very fatal consequences 
in the form of murder and death. So the cases you mentioned, Noor Mukaddam's case and Khadija Siddiqui's case, we don't have enough data regarding, we don't have enough information regarding what the motive was behind those yeah. crimes. But yeah. in other categories of crimes, the motive is very much clear because it has been investigated. And when once the case judgment is uh, finalized, the motive is told to us that this case occurred because of an inheritance dispute or yeah. because of a child custody dispute. So regardless of whether your society is conservative or whether it's independent of course uh, even in the most independent societies and the most advanced yeah, societies yeah. crimes against women still occur yeah. but in our in the specific case of our society there is somewhat of a pattern which tells us that when a woman tries to become independent yeah. if she even has the temerity of choosing her own partner or of defying her family and not going for an arranged marriage, a husband which has is perhaps probably 30 or 40 years older than us, who she has never even known. If she defies that and if she asserts even that modicum of independence, she is isolated from all of her connections. She is told that she is supposed to remain inside the house. She's isolated, she is beaten, she is abused. She is not provided access to justice or any remedy throughout this course of time. And then she is eventually killed and it is labeled as an honor killing. And honor killing used to be a defense which could be used against murder in Pakistan. Fortunately, it's not a defense that can be used anymore. But the case could be made that uh, feminist movements or simply asserting one's rights does have some link and some part to play in the rates of violence against women and femicide specifically. Hadi, would you like to? Yeah, so yeah, I'd also add on to this that there's definitely an image that you build around yourself in the society. And I've, I've always seen this and I've, I've been very closely um, involved with the Aurat March and I'm an organizer in Multan as well. So I've been very, I, I've watched this very closely that um, even I've I've been uh, treated differently, or even I've received um, unwanted advice on that that the the, the 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 newer you know causes that I've been involved in and the rights and movements for women's rights that just gives you a certain image in Pakistan. So so for example, a normal a normal girl or a normal woman, according to according to the, the patriarchal and misogynist circles, uh, would be someone who doesn't question, who doesn't question what's happening around her, who does not question the unfair standards or the, you know, um, sexist environment around her. So someone who does question them is put in the certain box or bracket and it's, they're treated differently. And they're, um, I've, I've seen, I've, you know, I've heard locker room talks and I've heard people talk about uh, w warning each other of them. So there's there's clearly a division where people, you know, treat um, uh, th these people who've, who've, who've realized that this is inherently wrong in the society and this should not, this has no place in today's day and age. Uh, they're being treated differently. Um, I've, I've been, I've been treated differently since I've been um, getting involved in this. Uh, but what was the other part of your question, Noor? Uh, like, I think you have answered. Uh, I was asking if there's an inherent, uh, if there's a cultural bias in these kind of cases, like a certain region that have a conservative culture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. High, Def high definitely. Rating, yeah. I think I think I see uh, because I, I I get to travel to Islamabad and Lahore for some mm -hmm. of my cases, and then I come back to where I've been, you know, born and raised in South mm -hmm. Punjab, Multan. So I see a very clear difference in society. And I've, I've discussed this with someone who told me that there's a completely different uh, culture and system of things that happen around these movements and these cases in, uh, um, you know, KPK in the north okay. of this country. So, so yeah. there's definitely a different culture and there's a different way of people, you know, treating these things and, and the number of number and tendency of violent crimes against women based on the area they live in. Thank you for answering our question. So moving on, I'm I would oh, like, okay, add Anna, you can add it. Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, sure, for sure. I completely agree with our colleagues from Pakistan. And I would like also to add like about 
to mention the visibilization that the crime of femicide has had during the last years. And I think that is something important to highlight, especially when uh, some people uh, say that uh, the crimes of femi the, the, the feminicides has increased, have increased just because the feminist movements or the women's demands mm -hmm. on their rights. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that we, we is it feminicide has existed always and it is yeah. due because of the inequalities uh and the power relations between uh, men and women but i think that during the last years uh, the the this phenomenon or the 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 use the usage of the term of feminicide has increased and in, in, in it, it has created a, a, a visibilization of the of the problem but i wouldn't say that uh, we 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 should like say just like okay like now the women are demanding their rights and that's the reason because the 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 rates of uh violence has uh have increased so i i and, and it is something very important to mention that visibilization of the problem and uh through the adoption of a term to to call this kind of uh gender killings is very important Thank you, Anna. So, uh, how would you describe the role of uh, Mexican government so far in trying to help out the families of the victims or trying to um, overcome the situation? Uh, and Nancy, Mexican government's role. Yeah, well, um, I think like years ago, um, the government started to develop different kind of public policies uh, uh, <clears throat> and laws, just only for mention um, some public policies. We have now um, places called Justice Centers for Women, and also we have a <clears throat> thing called Alerts of Gender Violence Against Women. So when in a specific state, the violence against women start to increase, then um, the government <clears throat> declared the alert of gender violence against women and they need to develop um, many different kinds of public policies to attend and face this problem. But um, we need to recognize that the, during the last <clears throat> years with the new government, we are facing as women, um, different speeches uh, of stereotypes uh, <clears throat> of our president. So we are facing a lot of um, different kind of issues because nowadays our government uh, is saying that um, feminists are against our government and the feminist movement movements are because just because uh, want to. Um, punish the, the government and that's unfair, you know? But, um, well, as we said before, we have many laws, many public policies, but nowadays we need to recognize that these kind of speeches are affecting us as women <coughs> because um, they uh, the government now um, try to um, um, criminalize the feminist movement yeah. only for, you know, um, have this hate speech. <laughs> so Anna? Yeah, for sure. And, and well, we, as, as Nancy mentioned, uh, I think that the government has uh, been active you know, in, in the adoption of, of these instruments. Now we have uh, like the, the general law and the right of women to live uh, free of, of violence. We have protocols to investigate femicide. We have trainings for, for, for judges, for, for authorities. And it, it this uh, much of this is thanks to the to the leading case cotton field versus Mexico and other jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court in, in the region about a feminicide. But I still would say that uh, we need to we need that the government adopts a, a more active role, especially regarding the education system. Because uh, always that we talk about the problem, the root of the yeah. problem of violence against women, we always come back to the, to the fact that how we are educating our future generations. So the government needs to, uh, to adopt new public policies, 
uh, in schools, in, in to promote among families, uh, this kind of uh, transformation of education because the, the culture, the sexist culture is, 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 is a culture yeah. that all of us will live in our, our society, yes. we, in our schools, in our families, in our like inner like circle of friends and colleagues. So I, I would say that uh, maybe yes. that is like the main challenge for, for the government now, because we, 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 are, we yeah. are already mentioned that we have a lot of instruments, but it yeah. doesn't matter no, if you have a lot of instruments, if you don't go to the, to the main problem, which is why the society is yeah. allowing this yeah. kind of uh, violence against right. women. So I think our situation is quite similar to what Nancy and you have mentioned. So Muxit, uh, would you like to add uh, into this regarding Pakistan, like the role played by the government? Because I think we also have laws, but uh, the criminaliz criminalization yes. of feminist movement. Definitely. Yes, Muxit, you can. Yeah, so when our prime minister when he fails to speak out against cases of violence against women that receive media attention consistently, when he waits days and needs to speak out against them, when he comes on national television and blames uh, okay, what's it? Yes. Yeah, are we still live? Yeah. I think yes, 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 you're live. Yes. So yeah, what I was saying was that when our prime minister comes live on television and he blames women and their choice of clothes in the uh, context of the case, and when he gives, he misses support for the fact that men will behave like animals, that a woman is dressed according to one society, that unfortunately does not help the cause of women at all in our country. In fact, what it does is that it creates, it creates this sort of a box. It creates and perpetuates those conservative stereotypes. And it tells us that as long as a woman stays inside this cultural box, which has been created, as long as she does not deviate from the stereotypes and the norms and the values which we have developed as men for her, in that society, when she steps out of that box, then anything can be done against her. It teaches us that we're only supposed to respect women who exist inside that box. And just let me clarify that women inside the box who observe the stereotypes and who conform to our cultural norms, they aren't safe either. Yeah. So the role of our government has not helped the cause of women at all. They try time and again to amend the laws and try to introduce legislation that favors women. but those legislations are time and again blocked by the religious factions in our government and the state structure, the Council of Islamic Ideology, etc. And any initiative favors women is blocked and handicapped by those factions. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Muxin Hadi. Yeah. So, uh, Anur, um, I think I, I'll start with uh, mentioning that the, uh, I think right before the 77th session of the CUDOR committee, the, um, the committee, the committee has clearly asked Pakistan that Pakistan government, the state of Pakistan needs to have, uh, needs to work on their um, medical evidence rules and laws. They need to work on the training of the police officials when it comes to investigating uh, crimes of violence against women. Um, and I think they have also asked about the the uh, recalling of the laws of Diyat and Kisas, because these are some of the, not all, but this is some from the list of factors that um, have been cr very strongly criticized uh, towards the state of Pakistan, that these are inherent um, uh, inherent steps that have been put in place, which have caused a number of acquittals for uh, people who have committed very serious crimes of violence against women. So the state of Pakistan has obviously it's it's a very huge debate. It's going to take we're going to be here all day if I start telling yeah. about how the state of Pakistan has failed not only women but men of this country as well, yeah. and the system just fails to. 
provide an adequate protection by the criminal justice system. Um, there are inherent problems with the prosecution, the uh, the people who are leading the prosecution departments, the, how the cases are prepared, how these cases never end up, no, almost never end up in convictions. And that's just um, common knowledge. Everyone, as long as um, individuals and people in this society are going to see and look at cases and realize that there's a way of getting out of it. If you've done something, doesn't mean you're going to get, you know, you'll have to pay for it. You'll have to go to prison for it. That's not necessary in this system right now. Um, and I think uh, I think that needs to improve and there needs to be proper, adequate prosecution from the government. There needs to be examples needs to be set up. So everyone's, everyone's you know, taking this Noor Mukaddam's case as a, as a test case and they want, they want uh, exemplary punishments from this case. But I think um, I have concerns. I, I, I have fear that he's going to successfully play the system again and he's going to successfully uh, go towards insanity plea and that's just going to, you know, um, keep things where they are right now. They have been for many years where the courts just fail to uh, properly punish um, individuals who have clearly committed very serious crimes of violence against women. Moving on, I'm going to ask uh, Nancy and Anayansi about the role that the regional human rights system has played uh, in Mexico in trying to uh, uh, con control the situation like the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights and also the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. So what do you think, uh, what role has been played by them uh, inside Mexico to, uh, regarding the issue of femicide? So Nancy? Uh, thank you. Well, as we said before, <clears throat> with these cases, before the Inter-American System of Human Rights, Mexico start to develop different kinds of measures. Um, but we have uh, many cases regarding gender violence against Mexico before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So we have not only Coron Field, we, only, we also have the case Ines Fernandez, uh, Valentina Rosendo Cantú, Atenco case <clears throat> and the case of Alvarado Reyes. And this is important because Mexico is being judged like <laughs> every year because of gender violence. So even if Mexico is developing many different measures um, for facing this issue, it's not enough because we are uh, as a state of Mexico, we are being judged because of uh, this um, type of violence. So <clears throat> we need to, to face that because also at the international level, we have um, also different uh, conventions uh, for the um, women rights uh, as the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. Uh, also the Inter-American Convention on the Prevention of Punishment and Eradication of Violence Against Women, the convention Belém do Pará, but um, is uh, been the same and we as I said at the start of this uh, conference in Mexico um, 10 women are being killed every day so that's like a red flag for us and we need to face that this is not enough so even if we have conventions laws public policies and many cases before the inter-american system of human rights this is not enough if we face our reality. And I think that this, this is related with the roots that all our colleagues um, <clears throat> developed before, because we need to attend the roots of the problem. We need to um, mo modify these public policies of the education that we, we are having in our countries, because we're talking now about femicide, but the violence against women start since the women, since the girl uh, born, so we need to face that and we need to um, to learn how to face that and attend that problem. Okay, and Anna? Yeah, just uh, briefly to mention that uh, and for our audience is like in our regional system in the Inter-American Court and the Commission 
uh, we have a very important jurisprudence in which the court has ruled and established uh, very important international standards uh, connected to how to deal with femicide in, in different countries. For sure, we have uh, mentioned a lot the cotton field case versus yeah, Mexico, and that which is case. the leading case Can and you the explain first the case? case of. Can you tell yeah, us about yeah, the it's, case? It's, yeah. Yeah, it's based yeah. on the phenomenon of Las Muertas de Juarez, the dead women of, of Juarez, which were a lot of cases that women who disappeared in the north part of Mexico and their bodies appeared some uh, days uh, after yeah. their disappearance with signs of sexual violence. And it, it was a very uh, hard for for country in the 90s. So we still have the problem. So the, the case uh, was about this and the court analyzed the way in which the Mexican government prosecuted those uh, feminicides. So it, the court found that the authorities didn't investigate the feminicide just because they they told the families of all these uh, girls that probably they just uh, had gone on a party or they were with their boyfriends so they didn't pay, pay attention to, to their disappearance so their mm -hmm. families um, these women were killed, uh, uh, raped, and killed, uh, many of them. So the, the court decided that the Mexican government was uh, accountable for, for this uh, lack of investigation, just to mention brief, like in a brief way, the, the, the facts of the case. But after those cases, the Inter-American Court has ruled some uh, other cases uh, against Guatemala, which is the Velasquez Spice and Belis Franco. And those cases are also about femicide. And the court, if I would say something important that the court has ruled in the three cases, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure that is recently the court ruled another one about femicide, but in, in these three, three cases, the, the court has emphasized the importance of the actions that the authority and have to take during the investigation is the due diligence. They, they have to be diligent when they are investigating, investigating. And also they don't have to allow authorities to uh, mix the gender stereotypes while they are conducting the investigation. They have to uh, consider that feminicides and the killing of a woman is really important and it should be investigated as well as a homicide or because the, the, the life of women are important. So um, just to mention that, and of course, this uh, jurisprudence and of course they, the commission has other like reports about feminicides has uh, given a lot of help to our government and to our region to how to deal femicide and yeah. to know more about this phenomenon. So you're saying they do have an impact on ground, uh, at least at the policy level. So Inter-American yes. Court of Human Rights, it's yours. Okay. So, uh, no. yeah. Yes, Nancy? Yeah, I, I also want to add just only a, yeah. a few questions. Um, you know, these um, decisions, these jurisprudence before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, start uh, being adopted at the national level. So yeah. we have a, a specific case, Mariana Lima, a case of femicide at the national level in Mexico, uh, where the court, the Supreme Court of Mexico, uh, took the, the points that <coughs> Inter-American Court of Human Rights developed before, and then we start using those standards at the national level. And I think this is important because uh, sometimes the jurisprudence at the international level is, uh, stays at the international level, but uh, now we can say that in Mexico, we are uh, adopting these standards in our um, jurisprudence with the Supreme Court of uh, Mexico. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, um... I have a similar question uh, from Moxer, like, so do you think that uh, it, uh, ratifying different international conventions, like uh, as Hadi was mentioning earlier, uh, like CEDAW and all these international instruments, do you think they have any impact on ground in Pakistan? Uh, 
because we don't have a regional system so we uh, and we don't we, do, we haven't signed the optional protocol to the iccpr so individuals cannot take their cases to the international court of justice as well so uh, what's your opinion yeah. on yeah this so the main legislation the international instrument which pakistan has signed regarding the rights of women is cedo that's the main legislation and that's the one that provides the international norms regarding human rights and applies them across a global level and pakistan mm-hmm. is yes definitely a signatory to that instrument yeah. but in my professional experience which includes the cases i've dealt with the cases i've heard being argued in court and also the case law i've been through in my years as a practitioner i have come across only five instances where an international instrument such as you know has been used to discuss or grant the uh, women their certain rights according to our constitution so these have been broadly constitution cases regarding asset access to justice maternity leave for women uh, equal opportunity in the realm of politics and governance and unfortunately it hasn't had has it hasn't had much to do with femi- uh, femicide and the killing of women so the problem even though it provides a host of rights which can be quite beneficial if they're actually applied in the pakistani context we as lawyers i think standing in a court of law are extremely unlikely to raise any concern regarding cedo we are unlikely to invoke that as an instrument to convince a judge that your honor please Definitely. grant my client these rights because these are the rights which pakistan has signed as an international instrument and right. we have certain international obligations which are applicable in this court of law the judge is likely to laugh at you and we as lawyers yeah. are very afraid about being laughed at by the judge by our opposing yeah. counsel and all of the countless lawyers sitting in the background inside the gallery we don't want to be laughed at that's the last thing that uh, anybody would want so we fear that if we invoke you know we will not be taken seriously and there exactly. is a focus on the national laws of pakistan that if there is anything inside our national laws if there is yeah. something in indian jurisprudence which we can use or if there is something provided in religious laws through quranic texts and hadith we will invoke that we will apply that but if yeah. somebody comes up and tells a judge that you're supposed to apply an, an international convention he's going to tell you that that is just something which pakistan signed to appease the global community and that is not something which is actually applicable in the pakistani context and you're likely to be treated as a, exactly. a somebody who panders to the west or something like that so yeah. unfortunately if we do that we won't be taken serious seriously and that's our concern yeah that's a very interesting point and i uh, you know i used to think that because we are a dualist state that's why we cannot directly invoke the jurisdiction of these international instruments in our courts but i met a uh, uh, human rights lawyer from philippines like uh, diane desieto she is also a un special rapporteur on human rights so she told me that in philippines it's also they are also a dualist state but they uh, frequently invoke the jurisdiction of these instruments in their courts so it's an issue in pakistan only that you're so afraid of resorting to this so thank you so much for a very interesting uh, insight so now i'm going to ask anayansi and nancy about if, if there if they have any suggestion for other countries who are facing the um, an increase in the cases of femicide because mexico has been dealing for this issue for quite some time now and you have had a lot of movements in the past uh, regarding the issue of, uh, this issue so what's your suggestion for human rights activists around the world and specifically for us like we have discussed with you the issue of pakistan so you do have a bit information <laughs> regarding this region as well so any suggestions for us or others yeah. well first of all thank you for sharing your experience in pakistan and feminicides in in pakistan to to my colleagues um uh, because it has been very illust- illustrative for us and for sure uh well i would mention that one step could be through the visibilization of the problem so we 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 come from different backgrounds and cultures and countries but we we can know that the common problem is violence against women so i think that the visibilization of the problem through the adoption of a term for example in latin america it has been very useful in a political way to show the problem adopting the term feminicide so we we 
we put a name on the face of the of, of the gender based killings and uh, for sure and also sharing our experiences like we are doing here through our practices in our legislation and uh, trying to find common solutions because of course uh, the background in, in Pakistan is, is it's maybe really different from the, the background that we have in Mexico but we we can find common common goals and, and uh, for sure the common goal that uh, we mm -hmm. see is like eradicating the violence wow. against women and girls. Mm -hmm. And well, it's like creating the, the awareness uh, of the problem uh, among uh, advocates, lawyers and, and academia to talk more about, for example, uh, the, the, to see what the, the, the African Court of Human Rights has said about the problem, or maybe to look in another region, for, except, for example, the European Court. Uh, which has also a jurisprudence on feminicide, but it, 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 the court doesn't use the term feminicide in it, it, the cases of the, the feminicide cases that the court has analyzed previously. Uh, the, the court always linked the problem of the killing of the woman to domestic violence, for example. Yeah. And which I, I say that is really important to say or to, to, to tell the, the European court is like, okay, the problem is domestic violence, but it's very important to mention that it was a gender-based killing. And maybe if you, you create a more like impact, if you, if you put a name to, to this phenomenon. So of course, for me, it, it, has, it has been a pleasure to, to share with, with, with you and, and with, you. with our colleagues, uh, our different experiences. And I hope to, that we can continue doing this to create our awareness. Thank you. And Nancy? Yeah, mm -hmm. I only want to add, um, we need to, to attend the roots of the problem. Because now we are talking about feminicide but we have a lot of different kind of conduct regarding sexist um, issues. So we need to identify these kind of, of conduct or attitudes that um, women and men um, use against women. So we need to identify these kind of issues and also we need to attend the roots of the problem because we don't need to wait until a feminicide happen. We we can deal with these kind of issues like uh, we can prevent them you know. from happening. This <laughs> and yeah, that's the only thing that I want to say. And thank you, Nur and the Global Institute of Law for the invitation. And thank, thank you. you so much for joining us. So now I'm going to ask Moxit and Hadi, both of them, like uh, what's what is in your opinion is the way forward in Pakistan? And like, what would you like to say? Muxet, you can discuss. Uh, so firstly, I think I mentioned this before, whenever a case of femicide or a killing of women occurs, there it doesn't happen in one swift motion. There's always a buildup. And in the people, uh, the people who I've met who have been victims of such abuse, they are always able to identify and pinpoint and predict that this sort of a killing or this sort of a violent event might occur against them at the behest of one of their family members or somebody else they are close to. They can always identify that can always predict that this is a risk which they might potentially face in the future. But right now, the state of Pakistan, unfortunately, forces these women to live with that risk and does not provide them any sort of a remedy which they can use to protect themselves. Now, something which is very basic, women shelters. We don't have enough women shelters that provide uh, shelters to women Same. from all classes and backgrounds. If a woman shelter did exist and if enough awareness was created that a woman can go to this domestic violence shelter or a shelter which houses women uh, who faced uh, any sort of a violent threat, then unless that happens, they don't have any sort of an effective remedy because we have to understand that women in Pakistan, they are bound and beholden to those households in which they live, in which their abuse is perpetrated. So unless they have good options of being able to leave those households and live in shelters and then invoke the legal remedies which have been provided them uh, inside the laws, until that happens and until we make that a feasible outcome and recourse for women, Unfortunately, I don't think the situation will improve yeah. 
much. Then there are the loopholes which we discuss, which exist inside our laws and laws which have not been notified, which do protect the rights of women, which if enforced, if implemented, would be something which could protect and provide an adequate remedy for women. Those lo loopholes have to be resolved and those laws have to be enforced. And lastly, I don't really Honestly, I don't believe that any sort of a new law, any sort of new government or any sort of uh, structure or regional body is going to resolve any of these problems until women are the ones who are fighting for those remedies. And this is such a huge burden which we unfortunately place on women and minorities and vulnerable classes of people in Pakistan, that they are the ones who have to be fighting and advocating and struggling for those rights. And there is nobody who can help them, who can help the other 50% are men, and those are the ones they're going to be fighting against. So unless they are out there and seeking and enforcing those rights and fighting for those remedies themselves, I don't think anybody else can come from the outside and help them and, uh, apply those remedies in their favor. So very unfortunately, there is a huge burden on women themselves to seek these remedies. And it is unreasonable to impose that burden on them, but that is the fact of the situation. Thank you, Mokse. So hardly. Yes, no, again, uh, there needs to be a proper and incomplete implementation of the recommendations by the CEDAW and the international obligations Pakistan as a state, um, you know, uh, has to follow. Uh, other than that, domestically, I think uh, we, we need to focus more on the household, just like Moksad said. Uh, a woman in Pakistan is much more likely to uh, be victim of violence in her own household than on the street uh, in Pakistan. So, so there needs to be, um, you know, more, more uh, focus on the household from the government and from each and every one of us. There, we need to have more... Uh, you know, um, difficult conversations with our boys. So there needs to be more conversation with the boys. There needs to be proper, there's a lack in the, in the recent cases we've seen there's lack of, you know, proper um, uh, attention and brought up on behalf of, on, on the, on the bring, uh, raising up boys. So, yeah. so we need to have these conversations in, in, in every household. Uh, these kids need to know from a very young age. Um, uh, what sort of behavior is not acceptable and what sort of um, uh, behavior which might seem minor and, you know, um, uh, which might be done jokingly or because of peer pressure or in our schools and colleges uh, might, you know, end up um, end up making them see something very serious, um, uh, you know, n n not as something they should be doing. So uh, that needs to be done. And then uh, finally, the, like Moksit said, the, the legal system of the country, which is the last recourse for any victim of violence, uh, that legal system needs to, you know, pull up its socks and uh, be available for all those victims and, you know, ease up the process of getting justice, not create difficulties for someone who's already been, um, been through so much. So that system needs to facilitate and that system needs to be swift uh, in its action. Uh, and that system, again, needs to set up examples for everyone. So, so as a society, um, as a, a, we still, all of us still uh, believe and work under deterrence. So um, if these cases and their judgments act as deterrence for people to see uh, and not uh, get involved in acts of violence, uh, I think only that is a way forward. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today. It was a great session. And it was, uh, it was a pleasure having all of you here. So we'll keep arranging more such sessions. Thank you so much, Anna, Yancy, and Nancy for sharing your experience from Mexico. And thank you so much, Muxed and Hadi for explaining the situation in Pakistan so well. So uh, it was an honor having all of you here. So uh, now I'm going to end the session. So thank you so much. Thank you.